to start remembering our immunology book and remembering how an uh, antibody looks like, how an IgG looks like. You all know that this is a heterodimer uh, molecule with two main domains, a variable uh, FAB moiety, which is defining the antigen uh, specificity, and a constant region, the FC moiety, that is defining the effector functions of the antibody. It means the immunological functions of the antibody. Obviously, after HIV infection, the immune system makes 100,000 antibodies against uh, the virus, but only antibodies against the envelope protein of the virus are able to recognize the viral particle or the infected cells. And you will know also that the envelope is the most variable gene of HIV. So the consequence of that is that most of the antibodies that recognize the envelope only recognize a few variants or a single variant of the envelope. Some of them, hopefully, uh, they recognize a wider range of variants of the envelope. And these are known as the broadly neutralizing antibodies. Mm. Uh, the first broadly neutralizing antibodies were identified uh, something like 20 years ago. Uh, they were four different antibodies with a relatively poor potency. But the technology to identify and to characterize uh, new monoclonal antibodies has been growing and has allowed for the identification of a still uh, short but a growing list of different antibodies able to block the uh, function of the envelope and able to recognize very different uh, strains of HIV across the different clades. Those antibodies recognize mostly conserved regions of the envelope, and we can find different specificities. Uh, this in, in blue, the V1, V2 uh, region of the envelope, which is located in the apex of the trimer. Uh, the glycan V3 region here, the, obviously the CD4 binding site, which is relatively conserved for the function of the envelope and is recognized by uh, antibodies against this region. But these technologies have allowed for the identification of new vulnerability sites in the envelope uh, close to the fusion peptide of GP41 and also in the interface region between GP120 and GP41. Mm? And finally, there is another uh, epitope Targeting, uh, targeted by neutralizing antibodies located very close to the membrane in the GP41 molecule, which is called the MPER, the membrane proximal external region of GP41. Mm -hmm. But no one of these antibodies is perfect. And this is a, a graph to summarize the potency and the uh, coverage, the breadth, of the different monoclonal antibodies that have been isolated. Mm. Uh, here you have the potency in micrograms per ml or in nanomolar, just to compare with, with other anti antiretrovirals. And this is the coverage of neutralization uh, using a panel of more than 200 viruses covering different HIV clades. These are the old monoclonal antibodies and this is uh, the group of new monoclonal antibodies. Obviously, the potency is much higher here, and the coverage is also higher. Mm -hmm. Most of antibodies with a high coverage show an intermediate potency, and most of potent antibodies show an intermediate breadth. It means that they only block 50% of viral isolates. So there is a 50% of uh, uh, pre-existing resistance to these antibodies. Besides uh, the envelope, other cellular targets may be used to develop antibodies, and we have seen the, the case of Ivalizumab. This is an antibody that 
blocks uh, entry by binding to CD4. There is also the UB421 that also blocks the attachment in this case of HIV to CD4. And there is an antibody against CCR5, which is called Pro140. But there is a huge difference between targeting the envelope and targeting a cellular receptor. And this difference is uh, defined by the immunological functions of the antibody. We have different subclasses of IgG, it's going back to the immunology again, uh, IgG 1, 2, 3, and 4, and when we are targeting a cellular receptor, we need an antibody with low immunological activity profile. We don't want our CD40 cells to be killed by NK cells. So this is why Ivalizumab, I think, is a, an IgG4 uh, oh, thank you. Um, uh, antibody. However, if we are targeting HIV, probably we want that macrophages uh, will phagocytose the virus, that uh, NK cells will kill the infected cells. So we will build our antibody in a IgG1 or IgG3 background, which is a much more immunologically active subclass. Hmm? Oh, sorry. There is uh, another function that is controlled by the FC moiety of the antibodies. And this is the half-life of the uh, IgGs in plasma. This is relevant for the singing, designing um, long-acting antibodies. This, the half-life of antibodies in plasma is controlled by endothelial cells, which uh, express an FC receptor on their surface. This receptor endocytoses the uh, IgGs, and those IgGs are released and are degraded by lysosomes. By modifying the affinity of antibodies for these receptors at acidic pH, we can maintain the antibody bound to the receptor and the recycling endosome will release again the antibody to the uh, circulation, to the plasma. So we are avoiding the degradation of our IgGs. And this is something that uh, is relatively easy to do. Oh, sorry. Huh? So we have a toolkit to start using antibodies for HIV prevention, for HIV therapy, and why not for HIV cure? We know, uh, we have a list of monoclonal antibodies, we uh, know the immunological functions, and we can modify the half-life of those antibodies. Let's start by prevention. Um, what do we know about prevention? We know a lot from animal models, and a few things from uh, human trials. Um, this is just an example of HIV prevention in uh, non-human primates. This is a very recent paper that summarizes uh, some of the concepts uh, that I have shown. Um, this is a paper from Marco Martin in Nature Medicine. Uh, the design of this study is a very simple. This is a single injection of antibodies and then repeat challenges with a shift of these treated animals. The antibodies chosen, this is an anti-CD4 binding site antibody, this is an anti-V3 loop antibody. The doses were 30 milligrams per kilogram. And the authors uh, used uh, antibodies in the wild type form, but also antibodies modified to increase the half-life. And the results of protections are shown here. Clearly, wild-type antibodies delay infections, but the modifier antibodies show an uh, extended half-life and therefore an extended uh, activity. Uh, for the case of uh, 3BNC1, one, one, oh no, sorry, the 101074, after 20 challenges, no animal was infected with HIV. So this is a, a long-lasting protection. What about humans? Uh, oops. Okay. okay. There are two different trials uh, that are being conducted in humans for uh, HIV prevention. The first one is not 
uh, a classical one, it's not the administration of antibodies, but is the uh, a gene therapy approach with an AAV uh, coding for the uh, monoclonal antibody PG9. Uh, the idea is to inject this uh, vital vector intramuscularly, and then muscular cells will produce the antibody as B cells do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the objective is to maintain high levels of antibodies long term uh, in do those treated individuals. This, uh, this uh, trial will be closed, uh, oh, oh, the, has been closed recently, and probably the data uh, will come out uh, soon. But, uh, they have tried different doses of AABs, and the the level of production uh, is expected to be high. Mm -hmm. Oops. Uh, a more classical approach. Uh, this is the administration of a recombinant antibody to HIV and infected individuals. Uh, this is the VRCO1 antibody, an anti-CD4 binding site antibody, and this is a very large study on HIV prevention that is being conducted uh, in the US with uh, men having sex with men, and also in Africa, uh, in women. There are almost 5,000 uh, participants in both the studies. This is called the AMP study. If you want any further information, there is a, a website for that. This is a long, long uh, study that is expected to finish in uh, 2022. All participants uh, are provided with PrEP counseling. Uh, the antibody is administered intravenously every eight weeks. Uh, and there are three study groups, study groups, the placebo one, and two groups with different doses of the antibody. And the doses are chosen uh, through a prediction of the pharmacology. The higher dose will provide levels of antibody higher than 10 micrograms per ml uh, in plasma. Mm. While we wait for this data, uh, the NIAID has um, defined a target product profile for antibodies in HIV prevention. And uh, this has been presented by Dan Kuritskis in the last CROI. And these are what the requirements that an antibody should meet should meet uh, uh, to be efficient in uh, HIV uh, uh, prevention. Uh, the product probably uh, one antibody is not sufficient, more than one antibody will be needed, and obviously the antibodies should have different specificities uh, to cover more than 98% of HIV strains, again, uh, across different subtypes which could be the target population for these approaches. Uh, young people and adult people at high risk of uh, HIV infection, but also infants from HIV positive mother. And the dose probably should be five micrograms per kilogram every three or six months, ideally six months. Probably in infants, a single dose of 20 micro milligrams per kilogram will be enough. <coughs> the tolerability should be good, and rare uh, adverse events uh, should be present. And obviously, the cost, which is also a concern, should be low, uh, lower than $50 per person per year, which I don't think it's a uh, ritual. Um, this is for prevention. So let's move to therapy, what we know about therapy with antibodies in HIV-infected individuals. Uh, we know a few, few things. Um, in fact, the therapy with antibodies in HIV-infected individuals started in 2005 with those very, very low potency or potent antibodies that were known 20 years ago. And, and I remember you, this 4010. 2F5 and 2G12. They show a very, very poor potency, and were, they were given to HIV-infected individuals. The effect was very poor, but they were safe. There was a, some delay in a, a viral rebound, but basically, antibodies were inactive. But at least, they were safe. 
this is the good news. Um, now, with the new antibodies, many, many uh, clinical trials have been conducted in HIV-infected and uninfected individuals with a v VRCO1, anti-CD4 binding site, the 3 bnc 117 10 and a variant of the VRC07. Uh, All these antibodies have been administered up to 30 or 40 milligrams per kilogram in intravenous uh, administration or also subcutaneous administration for VRC01 and 07. Uh, there is only one single study of combination of antibodies which is ongoing. And so now we have information of monotherapy with monoclonal antibodies. And obviously, a monotherapy with a drug targeting the envelope, which is so variable, is not the best idea. So the conclusion of these studies is basically that all antibodies, antibodies are safe in HIV uninfected and HIV infected individuals, and they are active, although there is a huge concern on pre-existing and developing uh, resistance. And this is just an example. This is the uh, trial with the VRCO1, uh, which is a good antibody. And um, this is in HIV-infected individuals, and this is the follow-up of viral load. As you can see, some individuals show a very nice decay in viral load mm, and sustained decay. But other individuals show no response to the antibody. And this is clearly associated to the sensitivity of the envelope to this antibody. And in addition, the uh, appearance of resistance was quite rapid in those uh, studies. So we have antibodies to treat HIV infected individuals, but those antibodies have several limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, one limitation is the availability. We have only a few antibodies, and there is no perfect antibody to treat HIV-infected individuals. We obviously need more broad and potent antibodies right now. Um, the second concern, the second limitation is resistance. Um, there are a lot of naturally resistant viruses to current antibodies, and those sensitive envelopes may develop uh, very, very rapidly resistance to monotherapies with antibodies. And remember that ENF is a very, very plastic protein. And a third limitation is the manufacture of the antibodies. The GMP production of these proteins is still expensive. So to overcome these limitations, many labs worldwide have started to design and to produce new synthetic antibodies that will increase the potency and the amplitude of neutralization. And I, I am showing just uh, three examples of that. This is the first one. This is a paper from Michael Farsan in Florida. Um, they design a B uh, specific antibody, which is not really an antibody. This is a FC fusion protein. They fuse the CD4 uh, domain that interacts with uh, GP120 to a uh, FC region of an, an IgG1, and they add at the end of the protein a sequence of an antibody that is able to bind to the coreceptor binding site. So in that way, when this molecule binds to the envelope of HIV through the CD4 binding site, this part of the molecule is able to block the CCR5 uh, binding site or the coreceptor binding site. So in that way, the potency of the antibody is increased and the coverage is also increased. And this is shown here. Uh, as compared to a monoclonal antibody, this molecule has tenfold more potency and remarkably, there is no virus isolates resistant to this molecule. All virus isolates can be blocked by this molecule with a wide range of activities, for sure. But there is no resistant, or at least pre-resistant pre viruses to this molecule. And this molecule protects very well uh, non-human primates from uh, HIV infection.
Another strategy is uh, to include several specificities in a single IgG1 molecule. As you know, uh, IgGs are symmetric heterodimers, hmm? but there is the necessary technology to make asymmetric antibodies using mutations in the FC moiety. So we, it is possible to produce B-specific antibodies with a high efficiency, and those antibodies obviously are able to bind to one epitope in the GP120 with one arm and to a second epitope with the second arm. When we compare the activity of those B-specific antibodies with the monospecific ones, uh, the activity is much higher and the coverage of HIV isolates is also much higher. So we are approaching the ideal antibody with a high potency and a high amplitude of neutralization. And this is a third example. This is not a B-specific antibody. This is a 3-specific antibody in which one of the arms contains a classical antibody, BRCO1, and the second arm contains two different specificities against two different epitopes of the envelope. And again, the coverage is increased, the potency is increased, and also the possibilities to escape is reduced. This molecule also works perfectly in uh, non-human primates, but there are no uh, human studies with these multifunctional uh, antibodies. Uh, which could be the target profile for uh, antibodies in HIV treatment? This is the same uh, work uh, presented by Dan Kuritskitz at Croy. Uh, in this case, the product also should be more than two antibodies, obviously combining different specificities with a high coverage, 98%, with always two antibodies against uh, one uh, single isolate uh, to avoid uh, resistance. Um, how should be the clinical follow-up? Uh, as simple as possible. Uh, no need for susceptibility testing. So if we are covering 98, 99% of viral isolates, I, we don't need to assess uh, susceptibility of the virus. Uh, the viral suppression should be uh, long-lasting and uh, there should be no resistance uh, to uh, these antibodies. Doses, um, lower than 30 milligrams per ml, Ideally, with these highly potent antibodies, the doses can be reduced to one milligram per kilogram. Um, and the administration can be uh, done at home by subcutaneously or at infusion centers, at the hospitals, by intravenous administration. Tolerability, of course, rare adverse events, no increases in inflammation. We are treating uh, HIV-infected individuals with uh, higher levels of inflammation. And one important thing is low anti-drug antibodies. If we want to treat for a long time individuals with an antibody, we cannot, um, uh, or we have to avoid the emergence of anti-drug antibodies that will remove the antibodies from the circulation. And the cost of obviously should be similar to our first line uh, therapy using antiretrovirals. Mm. Um, this is the summary for treatment. But I think that this summary is only taking into account the antiviral activity of antibodies. And as I told you, antibodies have antiviral activity defined by the uh, antigen specificity, but also immunological activities, uh, which are defined by uh, IgG1, 2 or 3 uh, subclasses. And I think that this immunological activity is relevant mainly for cure strategies. We don't need this activity for therapy because the antibodies have antiviral activity and we just need uh, uh, this antiviral activity. But to go beyond the antiviral activity, we have to, ha to take a look at the immunological activities of the antibodies. The FC region of the antibodies mediate uh, 
a large range of viral, viral inhibition uh, functions. Uh, the first one could be the uh, antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, which means that macrophages may phagocytose viruses, but also infected cells. Um, one very important activity is the antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, ADCC, which is mediated by NK cells. The antibodies bind to the envelope expressed on the surface of infected cells, and then they bind through the FC region to the CD16 receptor on NK cells. These activated NK cells, and NK cells will destroy infected uh, cells. Another relevant function is um, the antibody-boosted antigen presentation. Hmm? The antibody, when bound to the antigen, is captured very efficiently by antigen-presenting cells, and this allows antigen-presenting cells to boost antigen presentation and to boost immune uh, responses um, uh, against the virus. Hmm? And finally, also the complement uh, dependent cytotoxicity that can be activated by IgG1 and IgG3 and may also help to destroy infected cells. Are those activities existing in vivo? I mean, in HIV infected individuals, or this only exist in the immunology books? Uh, I think that they exist, but we have no proof for that. Eh? Uh, in fact, all the trials that have been conducted in humans with monoclonal antibodies are not designed to answer that question. So we have to infer um, the answer from current data. And uh, we know that the in vivo activity of, of antibodies requires the FC uh, moiety of the molecule. We know that Antibodies may delay viral rebound, so may have an impact on the reservoir. And we know that treating with antibodies may boost immune responses against the virus, so in a vaccine-like effect, eh? which is not dependent on the antiviral activity of the antibodies. So data suggest that antibodies may have an immunological uh, function in vivo. Hmm? But the only data that we have is coming from, again, animal models. We have no data in humans. There are two uh, main uh, experiments in animals that point to a immunological activity. The first one comes from the Nusenzweig lab. This is an early treatment with a combination of monoclonal antibodies. This is uh, three days after infection. So do not try to translate to humans. Um, and uh, this treatment induced a long-lasting control of HIV infection in treated animals. Uh, this is the long-term follow-up of the animals. And this control is not associated to higher levels of antibodies, but is associated to a good CD8 T cell response against the virus. Because when CD8 T cells are removed, from these animals, there is a clear peak of viremia that uh, once CD80 cells come back, viremia is controlled again. Uh, so early treatment with an antibody may uh, induce a long-lasting control of HIV infection. This is not clear uh, how, uh, which the which mechanisms are controlling this long-lasting activity. It could be also associated to a change in the viral dynamics during early infection. Obviously, treating after three days reduce the exposure of the animals to the virus. So it's not clear what's the reason for this control. To answer this question, there is a very, very nice experiment from Dan Varuk uh, that has been presented in the CROI uh, uh, this year. And in which he tries to answer whether antibodies have an immunological activity beyond the antiviral activity. Um, he treated also uh, monkeys, non-human primates, uh, in this case with ARP. Mm -hmm. uh, all animals were treated in the same uh, way, so the dynamics of viral 
the viral dynamics uh, before treatment was similar for all animals. And then, after two years of treatment, um, animals were treated uh, with a placebo, with a TLR7 agonist, with a monoclonal antibody, or with a combination of both. Uh, then, once the antibody was washed out, uh, art was interrupted, and the viral dynamics was follow up. Uh, obviously, the uh, placebo group rebound rapidly uh, and uh, reach uh, viral set point. The TLR7 treated group showed a more or less similar uh, activity with some animals not rebounding, but the most spectacular data comes from the uh, antibody treated groups and in particular from the combination treatment in which only a transient uh, viral load peak was observed in some animals. So I think this is the most exciting, exciting uh, data on uh, the potential use of antibodies for uh, cure. So in conclusion, uh, I think that um, antibodies against HIV are safe in humans, at least the uh, human antibodies that have been isolated from HIV-infected individuals. We have no data from these uh, modified antibodies, three specific antibodies and so on. Um, Antibody-based prevention and treatment strategies are feasible and could be relevant in some target population, especially in those fragile uh, populations with uh, um, uh, difficult to adhere to antiretroviral treatment. Um, I hope to uh, have convinced you that anti env antibodies are much more than antiviral compounds and they emerge as powerful immunomodulatory tools uh, that may play a role in cure strategies and uh, also these modified new highly potent antibody derivatives are emerging as new tools in uh, the field and we need uh, new data from humans in both prevention and treatment, uh, but all usually we need new data on clinical trials in humans to evaluate the potential contribution of antibodies to HIV eradication. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs>